All right, we are in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Actually, let's, let's go to Revelation 17. And we'll read that as part of just a couple of verses there to show you the correlation that John makes in uh, presenting two different, very different ladies in the scripture. John 17, 1 says, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So it's one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and he carries him away in the spirit to the wilderness to see the great whore. But then in Revelation chapter 21, the contrast is with the bride. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and twelve gates, and at the, at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Father, uh, for the reading of the scriptures. We thank you for your word, uh, which is infallible uh, word of God that comes to us preserved. Thankful to have it and to have a revelation of things to come and an understanding of the things uh, in this world, in this time, in, the, in our lives. We're thankful, Lord, for uh, the promise of the, uh, the new Jerusalem and the promise of the bride uh, being prepared for her husband. And we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us and strengthen us to understand uh, the text that you set before us. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. So we have this, this contrast between the two. Both of them have the angel uh, that had the seven last vials, the, the final judgment upon the world. One is set in a wilderness and one is set on a high mountain. One is the great whore and one is the bride. And so we're given the great contrast between the believer and the unbeliever, between the world and the church. And there is, there is a contrast. And if if ever the world gets to where the contrast isn't very great, then there's problems in the church. And there's problem with professed believers if their lives are not in contrast to the world, because God sets it off as a contrast. So the same angel that poured out judgment on the great whore, the unfaithful unbelieving of the earth, now displays salvation for the Lamb's bride, who are the faithful and the believing on the earth. As we've always said, the damnation of the wicked is the salvation of the believer, uh, removing the persecutors of the saints. So when the persecutors of the saints are removed, that is a part of the new heaven and the new earth. This angel must carry John uh, to a wilderness in order to view the unfaithful, unbelieving in chapter 17, the anti-Christian powers because the faithful dwell in a wilderness. The, I mean, the faithless, the faithless dwell in the wilderness. The unbelieving dwell in a wilderness. 
Uh, this world is described as a wilderness because of the fallen nature of the world uh, after the fall. It went from paradise into a difficult place, into a place in which there was trouble and, and hardship and problems. And that's how the great whore is pictured as sitting and remaining and content to be there in the wilderness. So John has to take, be t- taken to a wilderness in order to see that. Um, it was a faithless, unbelieving, it was the faithless, unbelieving sin of Adam that made the world a wilderness. The faithless have no foundation for knowledge. They have no sure ground for ethics. They have no future glorious hope, which is why the world's a wilderness to them. It's bewildering and it's full of tangles and troubles and problems with no sure end and no sure purpose to their lives. So it's a wilderness. What can you have without faith in Christ? Uh, What do you possess without that? You can have faith in yourself, but that's quickly uh, broken day by day as we see our own faithlessness and our own problems and troubles and sins and our conscience overcoming us time and time again. You can have faith in men, but you have the same thing. You have men that will fail you and discourage you. You can have faith in man's finite mind, but that mind has never conceived of the kind of glories that God gives to us in his revelation in the word of God. Without faith, life becomes a dry wilderness where the scripture describes it as no moisture, no refreshment for the soul. Without faith, there is no eternal hope, no love eternally, no eternal purpose, no glorious meaning to life. And so you're, you're stuck with just trying to make the best of this life now, or maybe trying to help some other people in this life and people find, try to find some meaning for it to make their lives continue and to go on and have a reason to get up in the morning every single day without Christ. Um, but it doesn't have that eternal aspect to it. So in contrast to all of this, we're given Revelation chapter 21 and verses 9 and 10, in which he is told to come hither, carried away in the spirit to a great and high mountain to see Christ's bride. So, and and these are important things. Um, Carla lost her sister this week uh, to heaven, thankfully, but still lost her, and it's it, it's always a time of, of great uh, soul tremblings and and when the when death King death comes along, the saints are thankful that that sting of death is taken away, but it is certainly a veil of tears that we live in because people die and our friends die and there are people that are close to us die, and uh, sometimes people that have helped us and influenced us in the Lord. And it's, it is a home going for them. And yet these are things that make us want to know and want to understand what is behind the veil. What, what, what do you come to behind there? So the angel takes John, not into a wilderness, but he takes him to a high mountain to see the bride of Christ. The high mountain indicates uh, an exaltation of the, of the bride of Jesus Christ. It indicates in the text something of the glory of the bride of Christ that she has and the superiority that she has. It's a great mountain with a great city. And, uh, and the city is great because it's described by as the holy city, Jerusalem. Now, the wicked in this world, dwell in high places. We find that the world in general, those who are in the high places are, for the most part, wicked men. Uh, When we find a man who is a believing Christian who loves the Lord Jesus Christ and he is at the head of a nation, we consider that a wondrous thing. It's an anomaly, really, in history as well. So the reality is, is that the wicked, while they're here on the earth, are often in a high place. And uh, and they're proud of that, they're haughty. Uh, 
as well. And many of them lord it over the humble. We talk about America as the last refuge for freedom in the world. And that's saying something, if that's the case. Uh, there may be a few other places in which you could find elements of freedom. But what that tells us is that in this life and in this world, the haughty and the proud and those who lord it over others and lord it over the poor are those who are in power in this world, in the satanic kingdom. Turn to Isaiah chapter 2. When you get discouraged about that fact, and it is a fact, which has been consistent throughout the history of the world, this chapter encourages me because it talks about the demise of the haughty and the demise of the proud and those who are often in a position of power in this world. They were in a position of power in Israel at time as well. Israel didn't always have a king after man's, God's own heart. And certainly northern Israel lacked it almost altogether. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 10 says, Enter into the rock and hide in the dust for the fear of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of man shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day at the great day of judgment that we're looking at in Revelation chapter 20 and 21. So that's an encouragement. When our hearts get discouraged and we see man haughty and proud and oppressing the poor and oppressing the saints, the day's coming. It says in verse 12, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that's proud and lofty and upon everyone that's lifted up and shall be brought low. And upon the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon the oaks of Bashan, and upon the high mountains, and upon the hills that are lifted up, and upon every high tower, and every fenced wall, and the ships of Tarshish, and the pleasant pictures, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of man shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. So it does two things for us. It gives us an encouragement in the midst of perhaps discouragements at times when we see who is in charge uh, as far as earthly kingdoms in this world and the oppression of the saints, the oppression sometimes not just of the saints, just of the masses themselves being oppressed, whether they're believers or unbelievers. That's an encouragement to us. It's also an encouragement to not allow pride to take us and for us to become proud or haughty in our mind because we know that God opposes that because God says that it'll all be brought low. And so when we feel the risings of pride in our own heart and mind, this text reminds us that we are to walk humbly with our God and that God walks with the contrite of spirit. He says, the idols he will abolish, they'll go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. And in that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats as useless. To go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? And those are, those are words of gold right there. That's a good verse to memorize. Cease from man. Cease trying to please man. Cease being impressed by man. Cease in having a, a wrong view of man in whose breath is, whose breath is in his nostrils, who's not like God and who's not God. God who is from everlasting to everlasting, he is the, he is the deathless one. But this man 
has breath. This man can lose that breath and can cease to live upon this earth. For wherein is he to be accounted of? So don't account him too high if you find yourself being a cowed or you find yourself trusting in any fashion man, looking to man, whether it's yourself or another person. We are taught here to put our greatest accounting upon God and not upon man. So in our text, we got the, the, the bride is on the high mountain now. Man, for the most part, is often sinful man, has been on the high mountains of this earth. But the saints, while we're here upon the earth, because everything is, is switched, as we know in the kingdom of God, that the higher made low and the lower made high. The saints here are the low of the earth, the humble. God dwells with the contrite ones, the lowly ones. He exalts the lowly. So says Hannah and Mary, both in both of their songs. And the poor, God takes those who know themselves poor of spirit and he puts their, his spirit in them and upon them and they go from spiritual poverty uh, to spiritual riches. Balaam, you remember what he said. He said, let me die the death of the righteous. Why did he want to die the death of the righteous? It's a better death because at the death of the righteous, things are changed. Things are swapped out. If you wish to know what is the end of the saints, <coughs> if you wish to view the end of the, of the end of the saints, the destination of the saints, our text says you have to be carried away in the spirit. Revelation chapter 21 says, and he carried me away in the spirit. This is the only way you can know the end of the saints, the destination of the saints, is if you have the spirit of God and the spirit of God has shown to you what is the end of the saints. Because they have a spiritual end. They had a spiritual beginning and life and they worshiped God in the spirit. And faith was the substance of the things that they hoped for. And at death, they remain the spiritual children of God. To see the Lamb's bride, you have to be a spiritual person. You can't know the Lamb's bride without having the Spirit of God. The Lamb's bride is the church, it is his elect, it's the saints. You can't know them, you can't love them, you can't understand them, you can't have an intimacy with them uh, without being a spiritual person. You must first be able to see the Lamb first, slain from the foundation of the world, and then you will be able to see and understand the Lamb's bride who has spiritual union with Jesus Christ. All through this book, John has had to be in the spirit in order to have these revelations and to give us these revelations. In Revelation 1.10, it began, I was in the spirit. And he had to be in the spirit in order to receive this revelation from God because we can't know God and we can't know God's purposes and we can't understand God without being in the spirit. And then in chapter four, verses one and two, he was in the spirit again in those chapters, chapter four and chapter five, he was carried up to heaven to see the throne of God and to see the throne of the lamb and to see that God and the lamb were in the, were in the same throne united together because you have to be in the spirit to understand something of the majesty of God and the greatness of God in his throne. And then in chapter 17, we already read that he was taken in the spirit to see the anti-Christian whore and, and their defeat. You have to be in the spirit to see that. You can't understand the defeat of evil powers unless you have the spirit of God and you have faith in God because this world sure doesn't look like it. And because we've lived out these 6,000 years amidst the wickedness of the world, evil men in high places, <coughs> the saints and the poor of the earth oppressed. And you can't see that victory of the lamb and of his, of his bride unless you're in the spirit. And then finally here, you have to be in the spirit to see the bride upon the high mountain, 
not the bride down low and oppressed upon the earth and persecuted and killed all the day long, as Paul says, but the bride on the high mountain, the bride exalted and put in a place of favor before God. So the question is, are you in the spirit and is the spirit, Holy Spirit, in you? Do you walk in the spirit? Are you filled with the spirit? Are you controlled by the spirit? And we maintain that life of God in us. And here's a, this grand little book by Henry Skugel, The Life of God and the Soul of Man, which Whitfield said he never knew what true religion was until he read the little book. Because it, it, it speaks of the spirituality of our life in God. So the principles of the word of God teach us these things. If you wish to go where the lamb's wife is, you have to be in the spirit. Secondly, if you want to see the lamb's wife, you will, you will have, have to be carried to a, a high mountain and great. It's called a high mountain and great. You must go to a great mountain because the church is very large uh, and it needs to be a large mountain to place her upon Though she is a remnant in history yet, she is a number which no man can number, the scripture tells us, at the end of time. So it is a great church and it is a great number and it is a thunderous choir that we have read about in the book of Revelation along the way. It's not a small group. Uh, it is what the, the text says, a mega, mega group, needing a mega mountain uh, to, in order to house the church. So at times we think we are alone, and Elijah did, but he said, no, I have, th have 7,000, but you can multiply yourself times 7,000, that's what's actually here, even though we feel alone. So the multiplication oftentimes is great as far as not knowing how many saints are actually around us. And we see that at times. We see that even in the, um, uh, the medical facilities here in Birmingham, Alabama, if you are in the medical facilities or visiting friends in the medical facilities, I have found many doctors who pray with their patients and who love the Lord and talk about the Lord with their patients. So God has his people sprinkled throughout. There's more than we think oftentimes, and we shall enjoy the company of a great multitude. You also have to be carried to a high mountain because the church is exalted. Even now, we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Even now, the church is above all principality and powers. We do not fear being inhabited by devils because it's not possible. The saints are inhabited by the Spirit of God. So though we see great powers and greater than ourselves out there, it doesn't bring fear and trepidation to us as though they could overpower us. Because the scripture says they cannot and they will not and the saint can't be demon possessed. I've had that question asked to me many times. No, the answer is no, they can't be because the spirit of God indwells them. And how oftentimes we have been protected in situations which were beyond us and which we could have been harmed. And who knows how many of those there even are. So you will have to be carried to a place that is above, very high. It's above all sin, above all failure. It's above all temptation. It's above all snares. It's above all the enemies of the church. It's above all the dangers that the church used to know. <clears throat> it's above all pain. It's above all sadness. And the principle of the kingdom that Christ gave to us while he was here is whoever humbles himself will be exalted. That's why you had to, he had to be taken to an exalted place, a high place. And to see the, the lamb's wife, thirdly, you will have to take in a, a very broad spectrum it's a, of a city. It's a great city. It's not a solitary place. It's not solitary confinement. It's not the solitary believer. That's why a solitary believer now is an anomaly. That's something that ought not to be. If somebody says, I don't want to be with the church, I just stay at home by myself. 
There's something wrong with that. That's not right because we're made to be social and we're certainly made as Christians to be among other Christians and to, and to love and enjoy um, the, the social aspect of our salvation in Jesus Christ. Because here is a great city. It's a multitude living in social harmony with one another. When we think of the great cities now, we think, I don't really want to be there. I don't really want to live in Chicago. I don't really want to live in San Francisco. I really don't want to live in New York City. And we think that way because the wicked are in charge right now. Because we often see them put in places of power. And we see uh, multitudes of them hurting one another. So when we think of a city, it may not actually conjure up great ideas in our mind. But here there is a holy city. It's a holy city. Now can you imagine if New York City had nothing in it but believers who all loved the Lord Jesus Christ? What kind of place would that be? When you stepped out on the street, you would not be in fear for your life. And when you said hello to a stranger, you wouldn't be told, don't, don't, you know, don't lock eyes with somebody because they might be some kind of nutcase. But see, this is what this city will be like because it will be Jerusalem, the holy Jerusalem, the holy Jerusalem. It will be an organized organism, a society where there are elders and angels, there's the Father and the Son, and the government shall be upon Christ's shoulder in this place. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 gives us just a quick glimpse of this place. Hebrews 12 and verse 22 says uh, that you have come to Mount Zion. Once again, it's the, it's the high place and, and the city of the living God. It's a holy city because it's God's city. It's the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly Jerusalem. To an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, written in heaven to God, the judge of all, the spirits of just men made perfect in Jesus the mediator. So it's a society of love and perfection where there are multitudes of angels, multitudes of men, and there is fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And who has ever lived in a holy society? Uh, men have sought that. That's why you have, why you've had and still have some convents and monasteries. They're looking for a holy society. They're looking for a little heaven, is what they're looking for. You had the Moravians who lived, and they had their society ordered in such a way in which they you know, believed would be the best and try to work out a holy city. You have uh, the Amish in their societies. You have the Mennonites. You have different people who have tried it on this earth, and it's really not what we're supposed to be doing while we're here upon this earth. Right now, we're supposed to be sprinkled among the unbelievers, uh, and a witness and a testimony for Jesus Christ. If you want a holy society, it's a church. And, but we don't live here in the sense of never touching the world or trying to get ourselves away from the world because the church is a witness and a testimony. Adam and Eve were in a perfect society, uh, but never again after that. There was never another one after that. So it's always been a failure whenever men have tried to create a, 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 a you know, carved out piece of the world where the world can't get in, and they can't do it because the world's in as soon as a human being steps in there because the world is in our hearts. And yes, it, so long as you have all believers, like in a church, then you have a better society, but even here we find uh, the world invades us and we have to be strengthened by the grace of God The best cities in our, in our world, what are the best cities? You know, they always have lists. Here are the 10 best cities. That's the ones that don't have as many people killed. Now, there's people killed there, but there's not as many people killed, right? I mean, that's the best we can do, isn't it? I hear Birmingham's not really a, on a great list, part of that list. We're on the top list of murderers, cities per capita, actually. So, but the best cities we have only have just the least crime. And the church should be the closest to heaven. To see the Lamb's wife, you will have to see a city that is completely set apart to love and worship God through Christ. 
There'll be no marriage or giving in marriage in this city. All, it says, will be like the angels, it says. And what it means is the holy angels will all be like angels, the scripture says. Which means we'll be fully committed to the service of God because the holy angels are fully committed to the service of God. We'll be fully equipped to worship aright because the angels are fully equipped to worship aright. There'll be no hindrance to instant obedience because the holy angels always have instant obedience. We'll be concentrated on heavenly matters because the holy angels concentrate on heavenly matters. There'll be no evil companions to hinder our service to God because the unholy angels were cast out of heaven. No internal conflict to hesitate us in our obedience to God because we will have had our sinful nature eradicated from us. No regrets for deeds done, fixed in a perfect state of righteousness, because the holy angels are fixed in a perfect state of righteousness. So when he says, there'll be no marriage and giving in marriage, but we'll be like the angels, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Something that makes some people sad because they have a marriage in which they enjoy a very close partner. We'll be close to everyone and have a spiritual intimacy with all. To see the Lamb's wife, we have been standing on an exalted mountain uh, because our Father um, state on earth shall be exalted very high. But John must be on a high mountain because the Lamb's wife is descending out of heaven. It's descending out, that's the next part of our text. He says, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It's on a high mountain because this earth will be an exalted place. The earth will be an exalted place in every fashion of, of that word, the best of that word. And, uh, but even there on the high mountain, as he is, she's descending out of heaven, you see. And that's why the new heaven and the new earth, the new earth will be such a wonderful place because she was fitted up there. You know, when we, a man might love cars and want to go to a factory where Rolls Royces are made or some other thing that they like and see it roll off the, the factory line to see this beautiful uh, piece of machinery come out. Well, here John is seeing the, 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 the lamb's bride's, the, the lamb's bride. And she is descending out of heaven. That's where she was fitted. That's where she was manufactured and made. Up there uh, where he has prepared a place. She dwelt high above the earth when she passed from this world. And she has been in a state of preparation to inhabit the new earth. She has been in heaven uh, receiving and enjoying the fullness of her salvation. She has been glorified and she has been given a robe. Verse 11 says that she has the glory of God. She's already been in the presence of God, so she brings with her the glory of God. When Moses went up on the mountain and was with God and face to face with God, he brought back to earth and back to his people a face that was shining, a shining countenance because he had communion with God and God had communicated to him something of his glory. And so we have her coming out of heaven. So it doesn't surprise us that she is shining with the glory of God because she's already been in communion with God. God's glory is his character and his nature, the perfections of his nature. Peter says that even now we partake of the, the divine nature. Even now, as Christians, that has begun. But to see the Lamb's wife now is to see the church possessing the glory of God of God here, perfected in the divine beauty, perfected in all the virtues. And the bride's wife is glorious. She, is perf she perfectly reflects now the Lord. Uh, when Moses possessed the glory of God, the people could not look upon such glory, but we will be able to look upon such glory because we are fitted to that. When Moses possessed the glory of God, it faded away, but it will not fade away in this city. In the new heaven and the new earth, uh, all will possess the glory. It will be universal. 
It will not be unusual and it will not be painful to look upon. It will be the new standard, the norm. Her light, he says, having the glory of God in her light, like a stone most precious, like jasper stone, clear as crystal. Her light, her glorious knowledge and wisdom that's been given and restored to her. She has knowledge, she has wisdom, she has holiness. This has been restored to her now. She has a wondrous light. That light is exponentially grown in splendor from the time that she first knew Christ here upon the earth. And this light is compared to a precious stone, I think for three reasons in our text. We have the value of that knowledge, what has been given to her, the beauty of that knowledge, and the clarity of that knowledge as well. He speaks of it. Of, of being clear as crystal. The value of her light is above riches. It is the pearl of great price, which we gladly forsake everything to possess. And Paul says, I count everything done to own Christ and to have him more valuable than all the world itself. How can you value that which has brought you from darkness to light? What value are, are you going to put on that? From foolishness to wisdom, cowardness to courage, fear to certainty. Used to have all these commercials. I think it was a credit card commercial. Talking about you can buy this, buy this. Then at the end it would say something priceless. Something priceless. So we can say that. This is priceless. Don't know what kind of price we can put on this. It's the highest of values. The beauty of the light. The value of the light, the beauty of the light. The beauty of the light is the beauty of holiness, the beauty of God's smile, the beauty of having divine purposes fully realized in our souls, the beauty of the aesthetic, that beauty which can hardly be measured uh, as well as hardly be valued. God gives for mere pleasure, for mere pleasure. Many things right now on this earth which are beautiful which have no necessarily utilitarian value to our lives, but there is an aesthetic value given to our lives which enriches us aesthetically. And heaven will be that way too because he's always describing heaven not just as a valuable place, but as aesthetically beautiful as well because God is beautiful. So beautiful that no earthly exchange could be adequate, adequately compensated. The earth is now filled with wondrous beauty. Even in a fallen state, what beauty shall we absorb in heaven? And then thirdly, clarity. The clarity of the light. He says in our text, clear as crystal. There's something to be said for clarity. Um, we like our water with clarity and, and not filthy. Um, we, pay, we pay more for clear water. Of course, our Parents and grandparents would never have believed we buy water in a bottle now. We honor more clarity, don't we? We honor clarity of expression. We honor those doctors that have clarity of thought in their diagnosing things. We honor politicians who have clarity of thought and understanding how a republic ought to operate for the good of all the people. We are pleased to um, have clarity and clarity of purpose is a wonderful thing for the soul. We shall have clarity from all of our teachers in glory. The lamb's wife shall have the clearest views of the lamb, which shall issue out then in stronger affections greater love, greater joy, greater peace, and how restful it will be, how restful it is to have things clear to us. I think one of the hardest things in a diagnosis, a doctor says, when he just says, we're not sure what it is. And we've tested 43 things and we're still not sure. And that's, that's difficult upon the soul. But heaven is described as a place of great Great clarity, great clarity. And uh, I think we'll wait on the rest. We've got some other things coming up in which he describes the lamb's wife, but we'll look at that next time together. 
Thank you, Father, uh, for your word. We thank you for the hope of eternal glory and uh, the glorious nature of the place that you present to us in Scripture. And we pray that you would give each and every heart and each and every soul a clear view of the Lord Jesus Christ and his atoning work that they might, by faith, embrace it and revel in it and enjoy it. And we pray that you would uh, be with uh, Carla's family as they've lost her sister and uh, the difficulties that it feels in the soul to lose someone in this life. And we pray that you would bless them and strengthen them this week and especially in the funeral as well, that you would give them uh, glorious views of our God and of the hope that you have um, made sure for us by the, the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our anchor and our hope and also the foundation for all these hopes. And we pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>